Welcome to another Bible study. We're so grateful that we have these opportunities to share the Word of God. The Word of God, of course, is the Bible. The Bible is God's book for mankind so that we might know ourselves and that we might know something about the God who has created us. And in, as we study the Bible verse by verse, we, God develops for us his whole salvation program. Because, you see, mankind desperately needs salvation. Salvation from what? Well, you're going to hear a lot about this as you listen to this kind of a study. Our problem is that we are sinners. And the Bible declares that the wages of sin is death. Because the sin of man is awful. Now, it, and, and as we, you go into any part of the Bible, you're going to find that message again and again and again. That we're sinners, that we're under the wrath of God and that uh, there is a way of escape through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in this particular study, we have been looking particularly at the book of Hebrews, a New Testament book, uh, and we have learned a lot about who the Lord Jesus Christ is. We've also learned a lot about what salvation is. We've come now to uh, the closing verses of chapter 3, and we, uh, in our last study, began to work on these, beginning in verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is, today, while it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation. For some, when they heard, did provoke, albeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that sinned, that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now, those are the closing verses of chapter 3 of Hebrews. And as you'll notice... This is a tremendous warning. A warning. Take heed, brethren. And we looked at that in some detail in our last study. Uh, we uh, found that, uh, that uh, again and again in the Bible, God warns us, make sure that you are saved. And really, that's the mercy of God. That's totally the mercy of God. It would be one thing if God had simply said, Now I command you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And He does command us to do that. And then stood back and said, well, too bad if you don't believe. But God not only commands us to believe, but he exhorts us and he encourages us and he and reminds us again and again and again and again, make sure that you are saved. Because what is the alternative? If we're not saved, we're still under the wrath of God. And God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, the Bible says. It's God's intention that everyone possible might hear the gospel uh, and, and in one way or another and, and uh, that we be reminded of our need of salvation. Now, one word that we didn't develop very much in verse 12 was uh, that there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Unbelief. And when we come to the end of the chapter... We read in verse 19, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. And they, you recall, uh, God is using the uh, illustration of the nation of Israel that was in the wilderness. And God had promised he was going to bring them into the land of Canaan. Uh, but most of them perished in the wilderness uh, rather than coming into the promised land. And God is saying here what their problem was. Uh, earlier, we had seen again and again that they provoked God, they strove with God, they, they uh, came against God. In spite of all the blessings God was putting upon them, they were resisting God at every step of the way. And God called that a provocation. They provoked God and uh, as if they were challenging Him. Uh, what are you going to do about it if we don't believe? Well, what did God do? They entered not in because of unbelief. And that is the problem uh, that is emphasized in verse 12. Take heed, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Now, 
In order to understand unbelief, we have to understand what it means to believe. What does it mean to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? There are those who, are, who are, think that as long as we believe we're sinners and that, we have to, that Christ is the one who came to save us from our sins, uh, as long as we accept all of this intellectually, we believe in Christ. And that, of course, is not what the Bible means at all when it talks about believing in Christ. What does it really mean to believe? It means that we have hung our whole life on Christ. It means that the Bible has become our authority. It means that Christ is our captain, our commander. It means that he is the one that we're going to trust very implicitly. And when he tells us something in his word, there's going to be a desire in our heart to be obedient to that. Or contrary-wise, if we find in our lives that as we read the Bible and we read something that really speaks to me personally, it's getting at something that I like and desire very much in my life, and yet it is, it is asking me to turn from that. And if I decide, no, I'm going to do my own thing, I'm going to go my own way in regard to this matter, then I've got unbelief in my heart. And God warns here that, that if there is an evil heart of unbelief in you, you will depart from the living God. Now remember, in our last study, we saw that this warning was to the brethren. Notice, take heed brethren. And brethren are those who are members of the congregation. God is not talking to the tribes down someplace that have never heard the word. He's not talking to people who have grown, complete, uh, grown up completely outside of the gospel knowledge. He's talking to you and to me, those of us who have been a part of the congregation. We have been baptized. We've made confession of faith. We attend fairly regularly church. Maybe we teach a Sunday school class and so on. And he, these are, we are the ones that he is warning. And if we find that there is a root of unbelief in our heart, that we're not really ready to, to bow before the edict of the Word of God. We're not really ready to say, Oh, God, if that is what you want, then that's the way I want to live. Oh, strengthen me. Help me to turn from my own ideas and help me to do it your way. If that is not found in my heart, then the question is, Am I really a child of God? And what will happen as we see... The language here, it talks about departing from the living God. Now, remember in our last study, we mentioned briefly that God speaks of the living God because He is the God that is alive, and He is the God that is the giver of life. He is the only one to whom we can turn to and find a hope, find an answer for our sins, find eternal life. He is the only one. We can trust in our riches, we can trust in our confession, we can trust in our, our, uh, uh, the fact that we do certain things, we can trust in a whole lot of things, but that's not what's going to be the living God. The living God has to be Christ himself, who is the giver of life. Well, we go on and we, we look at verse 13 briefly, exhort one another daily. And what did that word exhort mean, do you remember? What did the word exhort it means to come near. When we exhort someone, it's a word that is also used, or translated frequently, beseech. And it means to call upon those that we're talking with to come near. Come near to who? Come near to Christ. Come near to the Word. Come near to a, a response to the gospel. The, the normal attitude of the heart is to go away, to stay away, to... Oh, you're, yeah, we're going to talk about the Bible, but, but don't get into too much detail. Don't talk about sin too frequently. Uh, those are, are difficult words, and we'd rather not, uh, we, we want to be uh, identified with the Bible, but we don't want to get too close. We don't want to get too close. Have you ever had this situation with a friend or a loved one where, where you find that they don't want to be too close to the family. They don't want to get too close to a situation. Maybe in, at work you've had this happen where things are going on and you wanted to, you didn't want to get too close because you were afraid you might get embroiled in the 
in the argument or in the situation or you, you, it, make, it may make demands upon your life or whatever, you don't want to come too close. And that's, that's a natural defensive mechanism in our lives. When we see anything that's a little alien, we don't want to get too close. But the fact is, when we're talking about the gospel, the opposite is true. It isn't that we don't want to get too close. We want to be drawn as close as possible. We want to be brought into the very intimacy of the Word of God, and we want to know all that we can about the Word of God. We want to be drawn closer and closer to the Lord Jesus Christ because He is our refuge. He is our hope. He is our desire. He is everything that can be. And the thing that will come is keep us from drawing close. The thing that will keep us from drawing close is sin. It's sin. You know, if we have a besetting sin in our life, then you've had that experience, I've had that experience, and then you, uh, you start reading the Bible and it starts getting into the area where, where that sin might be in view, and, and, you know, suddenly you're passing over that page. You don't want to read that carefully. Have you ever had that experience? But the fact is, when we start drawing away from God, we're, we're departing from Him. Departing, that's the opposite of drawing near. Then it may indicate that we have real problems. And then notice, it goes on in verse 13, and we spoke briefly about this last time also. It is called today. Verse 13, exhort one another daily. It's a day, or remember we emphasize it's a daily kind of a thing that we... Daily devotions, daily prayer, daily talk with each other about the things of the Lord uh, because we should feed daily on the Word of God, just like we read in the Lord's Prayer. You know, how does it put? Give us this day our daily bread. Who is the bread that we are to receive daily? The Lord Jesus Christ. He is the bread of life. And, and even as we feed physically, on physical bread, so we are to feed on the Lord Jesus Christ daily. And that comes, that, that identifies with the idea of drawing near, exhort one another daily. We want to encourage one another daily to come and draw, be very close to the Lord Jesus Christ. While, and remember we, in last time we saw that it is called today is really, he is called today. The Greek really uh, should be translated this way here while he is called today. What's the implication of that? Who is he that is called today? Remember, we learned that it was Christ who is the day, and he is called today because he's the ever-present one. And as long as it is the day of salvation, he is today. That possibility of salvation is there. The day will come. The night cometh when no man can work. The night cometh. When, uh, when we, uh, he no longer is today for us, and normally in the life of any human being, it's when we die. When we come right up to that point and we have no assurance we'll be alive tomorrow, then it's too late. He no longer is today for us. It is too late for salvation. Now, verse 13, now we are going to begin to get into the new material here. Uh, notice the warning. Exhort one another daily while he is called today, lest any of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. When there is a root of sin within our life, so that we find that we don't want to come close to the Bible in that area of our life, watch out, watch out, watch out. It may be an indicator we're not a child of God, and if we're not a child of God, that is going to develop a hardening process within our life. A hardening. We're, as we, and particularly as we, as the gospel is emphasized to us, particularly as we have friends or loved ones who are trying to bring us under the, under the hearing of the word, or we're sitting in the congregation, and if our pastor is faithfully preaching the word, if, if we're not a child of God, we're going to, to feel more and more alienated. There will, Alienated, there will be a hardening process that develops. Now, remember last time we mentioned that, that when Pharaoh came up against the law of God, as Moses commanded Pharaoh again and again, let my people go, what happened in his life? His heart was hardened. And we read, of course, that God hardened his heart. 
Now, does that make God the author of sin? And the answer is no. The natural, the natural position of man is that we are completely alienated from God. We're completely in rebellion against God. But God, by His mercy, restrains sin in our lives and uh, puts us in a situation where we can hear the gospel, brings us into that congregation where we hear the gospel. It's talking about brethren here. He rears us in a family where there are Christian parents. And so he has, he has put down the, the normal sinful tendencies. He's restrained the normal sin, the sinful tendencies in our life so that we're under the hearing of the Word. But if we persist in, in going our own way, in letting that root of sin develop, God will harden our hearts. That is, he will withdraw his hand of restraint. And gradually we will become more and more sinful until we see this happen all the time. Here's a youngster that grew up. He got married or he, he got his first job. And the next thing, he's not going to church anymore. Have you, do you know anybody like that? We know all kinds of people like that. Here's someone who uh, went into the army. And, uh, and again, he, uh, you know, you wonder what in the world happened to him. He has no interest in the gospel at all. The, there comes a time when there is a hardening process that develops, and, and the, the, the warning, therefore, is that if we find that we're beginning to turn away from God, we're in serious trouble. Is there an antidote? Yeah, there is an antidote. We can cry out to God for mercy. Even though we're in the church and still unsaved, we can still return to God. There still is that possibility of salvation. Remember Isaiah 55, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his path. And let him return unto the Lord, for he will abundantly pardon. And that's, that statement of Isaiah 55 is, first of all, given to the brethren, to the congregation of Israel, and, and to anyone else who is in the congregation who is reading the Bible. That is his warning. Let him return unto the Lord and begin to cry out to God for mercy.